Hello, everybody. Welcome to our second last presentation of the day. Um, there, we, this is by somebody who probably isn't all that well known in the Haskell community. I, he worked on some obscure project called GH, GHK? Uh, <laughs> GHC, yeah. Um, please give a warm welcome to Simon Payton Jones. Right. Right. <laughs> Good, good, thank you all. Uh, One minor housekeeping announcement. Simon has asked that we not run around with a microphone. He will instead repeat all questions. Yes. So the, oh. the rules of the game are that we're going to have a lot more questions, but they're going to be quick, right? So, so no way to just start. And I will repeat the question or f um, frame an answer in such a way you don't need to hear it. So I want a lot of interaction. I should be very, terribly disappointed if you all sit there like bread puddings. But we're going to go fast, and I want, I want to, but I want you to stop as soon as you get to something you don't understand, OK? So, um, uh, uh, this is, has been a very popular sort of genre in um, you know, uh, television documentary programs, a history of something in a hundred objects, typically looking at old artifacts and particular examples of old, old artifacts. So this is the secrets of the GHC type checker in a hundred di type declarations. Um, and it is indeed an old artifact. It's about 30 years old. It's quite a large artifact. It's about 30,000 lines of Haskell. Fi sorry, 50,000 lines of Haskell, as you'll see. So we're not going to look at every detail, but we're going to, I hope, to give you a sense of the geography of the type checker so that you know where to look for things when you want to dig into some detail. OK? So that's the prospectus. So uh, here's this, the picture you've seen a lot um, uh, already about the, the, the compiler pipeline. Uh, Sam talked about um, the renamer, and now we get to the type checker. So you remember that the renamer um, is uh, renaming a big abstract syntax tree, called, which we call hssyn. I'm going to show you a bit more about it. And the type checker produces an elaborated syntax tree, also in hssyn. We're going to take a little bit of a look at that. And then desugar occurs after that. So that's, the, um, that's our sort of big picture. Remember, we were working over the abstract syntax tree of the original language. So before getting much into the type checker, the first data type I want to look at is the, the abstract syntax tree itself. Ryan talked a little bit about this and the trees that grow stuff in his part. I want to give you a little bit more detail because if you look at this and it all seems like black magic, it's, I, I hate black magic. I, like, I want to um, understand it. So I'd like you to have a visceral sense of the way the trees that grow stuff works. And the idea is this. We want a language, sorry, GHC independent description of the abstract syntax tree. And that lives in the source repository in language.haskell.syntax. And there's a bunch of other modules. That's meant to be completely GHC independent. And then there's a kind of in ghc.hs.blah, you will find a collection of files that deal with, that customize this data type for Haskell using this trees that grow metaphor that I'm going to um, describe a little bit more to you. And there's a good piece of documentation in the wiki here. Um, this is a I think all these slides are, <coughs> are um, on the website already, I think, as they were uh, uh, since five minutes ago. So uh, that's right. So you can follow along. If I go too quickly, you miss a slide. You can just look at the slides on the um, on the website. So just as a little side digression, we'll have a number of little, number of little side digressions. The wiki is really useful. I use it a lot. Um, here, it, here is its address. It's available in the menu bar at the side of the main source repository. Um, and here's its here's its front page. And among other things, it has a little uh, stuff under documentation. That's a little bit about trees that grow. So this this link here is right here. And Ryan talked a bit about um, uh, layout and coding standards, right? And there's, a, there's a bit here. And this is all a wiki, right? So this means that everybody, including you know, all of you, can edit it directly. You don't even have to make merge requests. You can just edit it. So the danger is, of course, because it's a wiki, it just goes out of date. So we get tragedy of the commons. Lots of people read it and nobody write it. So please, could you take upon it yourself to not be satisfied with out of date or misleading or confusing information on the wiki? Ask questions, talk to somebody, and then fix it. Could you make that commitment? Take your hand up if you're willing to do that. Now, back to trees that grow. Uh, so here is the, um, the language independent part, right? So, and here's the data type for HS Expert, the expression type. And it has, I think, about 40 constructors. There's one for each syntactic form. There's even one for parentheses. So if you put a, um, a thing in parentheses, you'll get an HS par constructor. So the idea is you can reconstruct exactly what you wrote. Infix operators are different than prefix ones, and so forth. And every, so here's variables, literals, uh, here's infix operator applications. Um, and for infix operator applications, you see here's the left argument, here's the, um, the operator, and here's the right argument. But you can see they've each got this funny thing at the front, this x thing. That's the extension field of the trees that go. Every constructor comes with an extension field. And what are these x var, x lit, and so forth? They're all type families. 
So they may vary depending on this type parameter. And this parameter we think of as being, that's the way which you configure the tree. Different instantiations of P, which has kind type, give you different kinds of syntax tree. Right? Um, so uh, every, every constructor comes with its own type family. right? So 40 constructors, 40 type families, plus one more at the end, xexpr, is used when you want to have new constructors. At, at, you know, after the type checker, we want to add to, might want to add some more constructors to the type. So that's this type family here, xxexpr. And we're going to see an example of how to use that. OK? Um, then finally, uh, this guy here, uh, look, the, he's got an extension field xfar, but this lidp, l stands for labeled, id stands for identifier. Um, this is, what, what are variables? So what is a variable in the tree? Well, um, here, this is just a type synonym for xrec. We've got to come back to xrec. And here's this IDP thing. And this is the actual payload of variables. Is it so after the uh, parser, it's going to be a rudder name. After the renamer, it's going to be a name. After the type checker, it's going to be an ID. So it's not just the extension fields that can vary depending on where we are in the type in the in, in GHC. It's the uh, the actual payload can vary as well. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So this P thing, remember, is not GHC specific. Uh, that can vary. You know, the, the, you, if you wanted some completely different client, you could have a P that was um, you know you could instantiate P with some type of your own. But for GHC as a client, so this blue stuff is now in, in um, ghc.hs.extension, right? Not the language independent. This is now GHC specific, right? And in the GHC specific bit, we, um, uh, we're going to instantiate that P parameter with GHC pass of parse, GHC pass of renamed, and GHC pass of type check. What's GHC pass? It's this little, um, uh, this little data type with three, um, three constructors. Okay, and so here's the here are the three phases of um, uh, three phases of GHC after the parser, after the renamer, after the type checker. Um, so if you see GHC parse of parse, that's that's what's going to instantiate P after the parser. GHC parse of type check, that's going to be what instantiates P after the type checker, right? And then there's these just these type synonyms. So usually you will see something like this type instance. Um, th this now tells us that the extension field for infix operators in GHC after the parser is this, mm, what is that, something mysterious to do with uh, annotations. Actually, I'm not quite sure what this is, but I know what this is. After the renamer, we have stuck in this extension field just a fixity. And after the type checker, what happens here? Oh, this is funny. After the type checker, it looks as if this guy can't happen at all. Right, so somehow the type checker has got ridden of these um, uh, these um, op apps. Okay, so yeah. First question: What is the tick before? What is the tick here? Oh, this is a tick for uh, the question. What, what's the tick? This just says parsed here is a data constructor, right? But it's appearing in a type. When data constructors appears in types to signal that this is, you know, this is really a data constructor, you can give it a tick in front. If it's unambiguous, you can leave the tick out. Um, this is just, this is the data kinds extension. Okay, so far so good? All right, uh, so, uh, yeah, anybody? Yes? Why do we have data con can't happen at all? Well, suppose this constructor was impossible at a particular phase. Could you just make it void? Oh, could you make, this is essentially void. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's an empty data type. But void, yes, it, it's a way of saying void. A type family without an occasion is kind of void. I mean, we, sorry, we, uh, I'm going to get us out of this rat hole shortly. Really, these should be strict. This should be an empty type, empty type and then it really couldn't happen at all. Um, at the moment, this, these could be instantiated with, you could make a bottom value of this type. and uh, so, so it's not quite that it really can't happen, but it's a strong signal. Okay, so, uh, so much for the... Um, um, uh, so much for these extension fields. I want to talk uh, quickly about um, this XREC business. What's, why, why REC? So is it for record? No, it's for recursion. And, it doesn't, and it's not really a fixed point combinator. All it means is this is a label. Uh, this is a sort of, I'm attaching an, uh, an annotation to, a, um, uh, to, the, to the second argument. So look here. This op app has, um, you know, its arguments are not HS experts there. LHS experts. What's an LHS expert? Simply a type synonym for XREC 
X rec of P of HS expo of P. Now, what does that mean? That's, so this X rec thing is going to be a way of saying, I could wrap something around here. So X rec could be a type family that just returned its, uh, returned its argument, in which case it would wrap nothing. But in fact, in GHC, X rec of any GHC pass, right, whether pass renamed or type checked, from any GHC pass, X rec is this gen located thing. What's gen located? It's just a pair, right? So this says, and this L guy is meant to indicate some kind of source location. So in this way, every syntax tree goes, you know, an HS expert exp expression, and then a source location, and then another HS expert data constructor, and then another source expression. Every node is labeled with its source span, it, it, both its beginning and its end location. Does that make sense? Um, so uh, GHC always has a very good notion of, of in, wherever it is in the syntax tree, of which bit of the source text you're referring to. Uh, this anno thing is more or less just a source location, uh, but it's grown more stuff so that we can reproduce exactly what the user wrote. Yes? Uh, is the XREC thing a recent addition? Is, it, is XREC a recent addition? I don't know, maybe three or four years ago? Yeah, at the back. Oh, in this, in here, the three electric experts, what are they? This is the left argument, this is the operator, and that's the right argument. So that was the, um, uh, we talked about the, I've talked about the payload as well. Uh, I just wanted to talk about this last thing, right. So this extension constructor, it may vary between GHC passes as well. So for XX expo, after the parser, oh, again we have data can't, ha can't happen, which means, uh, like void again, which means there are no, uh, XX, X expert doesn't happen after the parser at all, right? After the renamer, there's this single, single data type, HS expansion, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, and then after the type checker, there's this, there's this data type, XX expert GHCTC, which is a whole data type here, um, and it has several constructors because the type checker needs to add several constructors to the data type. Does that make sense? So I'm hoping you get some, some idea about how you can use this to uh, vary the data type between passes. And also, but none of this is uh, only the bits in blue are GHC specific, the bits in yellow are not GHC specific. Yes. Uh, so this is a question about whether we want void or unit in these, in these extension things. Again, I'm not, I'm, and, it's, and it's a good question, and we should talk about it, but not now. Um, so the exact design of this, I think, is not completely settled. And in fact, if somebody would like, you know, would like to pay attention to this and really think, think through the details and, and then write them out articulately on, articulately on that wiki page, that would be really helpful. Um, we do. Uh, uh, but we still, it'd be nice to be, nice to be able to have in one of these extension fields, it'd be nice to be able to say, it really cannot happen. Please repeat the comments. Uh, yeah, so, so it was, uh, thank you. Uh, Vlad said, well, uh, we do have unit in one place and void in another, uh, and, I'm, uh, and I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to have, a, because the thing is, if you look at GHC source code, you will see mountains of these type families, and you know, XX, GHC, TC, you know, you, you look at this, you think, God, give me a break, right? <laughs> but if you have a sense of the larger geography, which I hope you have now, then you can find your way around, and you know, and you know which bits are, you know, language of Haskell, GHC independent, GHC.hs, GHC dependent. Do you, do you get the idea? I just want you to understand it rather than use cargo culting to say, oh, I'll just sort of modify something and hope it works, right? Okay, now then. Um, the second thing I want to talk about was uh, this question about type checking um, the original source language. One thing you can do with the type checker is to desugar the entire language into some smaller intermediate language and type check that. That has the advantage the type checker has much less syntax to deal with. But the error messages are going to refer to the desugared stuff and that's pretty bad. So from the beginning, GHC always had the idea of, look, let's type check the original source code as written by the user, undesugared. But that can be extremely hard work. Right, so we sort of stuck to this. We clung on by our fingernails. You know, I wrote hundreds of lines of code to deal with um, uh, record updates. Why? That is a nice little example. Here's a, uh, a record type and an update. Oh, and look, X has type T int char, but this update re rewrites info one to be a bool. But previously, info one was a. There's an a. Was an int. Right, so the type of the record gets changed by this update. 
and then the fields might be higher rank and polymorphic and I tore my whole out, hair out trying to write this, but if you just expand it to, you desugar the record update to a pattern match and a data construction, then the code we have already for pattern matching and the code we have already for data constructors, just handle it. It's so much easier. Yeah, so question. Oh, wasn't it possible to desugar and keep the reverse mapping or keep the original? I'll give you your payoff later. Um, that is exactly what we're going to do, right? Um, so, um, but let me give you one, a second reason why we might want to desugar first, and that is rebindable syntax. It's quite a useful feature of Haskell, a bit, a bit unprincipled, but people really like it, which is to say, with dash x rebindable syntax, then when you have a literal like three, which we all know in Haskell expands to from integer three, instead of getting the built-in, you know, Haskell provided from integer, you get whatever from integer is in scope. And if the from integer that's in scope has a funky type like integer arrow a arrow bool, well, that's what you get. Um, so the definition of what it means to be typable is expand and then type check, right? So it's kind of like you have to desugar and, and then type check. So, um, there's a bit about this is described in the rebindable syntax. I think Ryan's made, already made reference to this. So what are we going to do? Just as um, B B Burke B B B B begins with B. Andrew. Oh, Andrew, sorry. I'm just, <laughs> you're just on the same line of sight, and I beg your pardon. Andrew, just as Andrew suggested, we're going to um, uh, desugar the expression, as it were, on the fly, and then but keep the old one. So um, in this extension field, in the output of the renamer, type to instance xxx per ghcrn, we're going to add one more constructor, hs expansion, and these two things are going to be the original expression and the expanded expression, okay? So and let's do a first approximation. Let's say we do this in the renamer. We'll do the expansion in the renamer, and the type checker sees one of these hs expansion nodes. Now, what does he do with that? Well, he's going to type check the expanded version. What does he do with the original? Well, he's going to sort of leave it on the context stack. Remember, when GHC produces error messages, it says, in the expression, this, right? It, it gives you source locations, right? It's going to use this, uh, uh, this first field for the source locations. Um, and then it's going to uh, go into this, this expanded thing. And when it goes in the expanded thing, there's lots of nodes that have been created there from the desugaring. Those nodes, their location will not say, I'm source span, you know, character position to that. It'll just say, oh, I'm generated source span. And the type checker, when it gets to, I'm generated source span, will say, I'm not going to put that on the context stack, right? So it just walks inside the expression, not, you know, going in this, in that, until it comes back to, of course, inside this expansion, we'll get back to some of the original tree, which has nice source locations on it. OK, so that's the idea. Um, so um, you'll find this extensively documented, um, but it is something of a work in progress. I just want to tell you one squishy bit so that you know what to look out for. There's two places we could do this desugaring. One is in the renamer. Now, it has the advantage that it's sort of, you know, it's all done and dusted. The type checker doesn't have to think about it. And quite a lot happens there. So this long comment, um, which I encourage you to read, is it, I think it's in the, it's in the renamer. You can just grep for it. Um, and it expands, you know, something like HS over label, which is overloaded labels, which I'm not going to talk about. But it expands it into an X expo, remember, of an HS expansion. And then here's the original. HS over label, the unexpanded thing. And then here's the expanded version, which is the application of from label to this string foo. OK? Um, and that's what the type checker is going to The type checker is going to type check this latter thing. OK? That's one place we can do it. But it turns out that um, the, uh, sometimes the expansion is a bit affected by things that only the type checker knows or uh, things that type checker has discovered from type checking earlier declarations. So another place you can do it is right at the beginning. When we come to the expression, uh, like a record update here, this is a good, this, is, this really is code from GHC. When we come to record update, the first thing we do is we desugar it to produce an expanded thing and then feed it right back into, this is, this is type checking expressions, we feed it right back into type check the expression, okay? So the type checker is doing a little bit of expansion on the fly, as it were. And I'm a bit schizophrenic about which of these two is best. Currently, we, there's both, so it's just something to watch out for. Maybe we should move comprehensively towards one or the other, but I'm not in a hurry to do that. But it's just something to look out for, OK? Any questions about this? Yeah. 
oh, how do you present the error message structures on the desugared form? We don't, all we have in this, in this desugared form is a pair of the expanded expression and the unexpanded expression. And it's up to the type checker to, to produce as good error messages as it can from that. But that's much better than forgetting about the unexpanded expression. Is it more work than creating good error messages from the source? I don't think so, actually, because in, in these complicated cases, it's hard to generate good error messages anyway. Uh, so I think, it, I, I think it's I think this is actually a qualitatively better path. It was getting monstrously complicated to try to type check the original, especially with rebindable syntax. Yes, this, the question was, have you considered using row polymorphism to redesign this? Uh, to paraphrase your question. Yes. No, but feel free to propose it. But only internally. But, uh, I don't, uh, just talk about it later. But I have not thought about that. Well, that was your question. No, I have not thought about it. If you want to think about it, go be my guest, right? It's an open source project. <laughs> you have to implement row polymorphism first, of course, and that's a whole thing. OK, so now back to type inference. Fine. So we, now we've sort of laid the groundwork. We're gonna, uh, now we're going to talk about type inference. Um, so here is the um, uh, type signature of the, main, the sort of core type checking uh, code for expressions. It has a nice small type signature. Uh, TC Mono Expo. Uh, you can look in this module, right? I hope you are. You have your GHCs open, you know? So TC Mono, it takes a, um, a, uh, a, a piece of source code, um, the abstract syntax tree that came out of the renamer. It takes an expected type, which we'll say a little bit more about, and it, um, in the type checker monad, and it coughs up a so-called elaborated term, an elaborated piece of syntax tree. I'm going to talk about all of these three pieces, right? So first of all, just the monad, very briefly. The monad carries a lot of things, right? It carries the type environment, what's in scope, and what type does it have. It carries the ambient level, we'll talk about that. It carries an error context, that is, what expression am I inside? Every time you go inside a sub-expression, we push something on this context stack so that when we generate an error message, we have a nice little stack of places that sort of breadcrumbs that where we know where we come from. It has a template Haskell stage that I'm not going to talk about at all. It has some state to accumulate emitted constraints that I will be talking about and to accumulate error messages. It has, uh, it has all, all, uh, quite a lot of things, and so you'll find, it, they'll find them all in, um, uh, let's see, in um, this local env, so this is in um, uh, GHC TC types local env, and TC local env, here it is. Is this big enough to be legible? Yeah. Um, yeah, so you can see it has this context thing. That is the reader monad, it's just pushed down, and it has some state stuff, a usage env. This is to do with the uh, multiplicity and linear types, which um, uh, I barely understand. Uh, has, this is the constraint generation stuff that I will talk about, and these are the error messages. And then in the local context, that is the, the, the reader monad that we're, um, uh, we're walking down. Oh, there's mountains of stuff. Um, there's, you know, wh where are we? Uh, where, what's source fund? This is the stack of um, error contexts we'll talk about. Are we inside generated code? The, the, uh, the type checkers level, oh, mumble, mumble. The um, what's in scope, the, ah, oh, um, you can get tired looking at this, but I'm not gonna go through every detail. Well, this is the place to look if you want to know what does the type checker know about the context in which it is type checking this sub-expression, okay? Um, and this, that, that little piece of environment gets um, augmented as you walk inside sub-expressions, okay. Um, just a little bit more about the error context. This is, this is you remember, this, when you get this kind of in the first expression, in this, I mean, I know this gets, um, uh, can get onerous um, when you're uh, reading it. Because they can, these, I'm not sure this is the best um, API, hence all this stuff we're doing with HLS and, um, um, uh, and um, error data types um, uh, and so forth. But, um, but at all events, that, it comes from that um, stack of error context we were discussing. Okay. Now. Next topic, why does the type checker generate this? Why do we spit out a term as well as taking in a term? Well, it's because we're going to elaborate the input term. What does elaborate mean? Well, um, here's the input. I've just wrote in my source program, lambda x is sort reverse x's. Um, but on the, what is this sort? Sort, remember, oh, well, did I write the type of sort? Yes, for all a, ord a, double arrow, a to a. In the elaborated term, um, I have to apply sort to a type and to a dictionary of, you know, methods for ORD, and reverse has to be applied to a type. So this is getting towards GHC's intermediate language. Um, 
So um, every and every binder gets decorated with type X's here, has type list of int. That wasn't explicit up here. It's explicit down here. Every binder is decorated with its type. Um, so quite a lot has happened here during elaboration. And indeed, um, if I've got um, uh, this foo function, also, since it's polymorphic, this, this foo was not polymorphic. This foo is polymorphic. So it gets a big lambda, and, a, and it got to abstract over this dictionary here. So the red stuff is all the elaboration. Yes. So the HS expert extended with these elaborations is isomorphic to, isomorphic, to, is it isomorphic to core? It's isomorphic to core in the sense that we're going to convert it into core, right? But of course it's vastly, it has, it has 150 data constructors instead of eight. So for some value of isomorphic, yes. But, um, you know, it, 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 is, it is as expressive as core, shall we say. We are not doing the translation to core already, no. We're not doing the translation to core. Let me show you. How do these elaborations show up? Well, uh, let's see. Here it is. Here is how the elaboration shows up. Do you remember? And the output of the type checker, that XXX with the extra data constructors, that's going to be this XXX with GHCTC that I scared you with a few slides ago. And it has, XXExpo GHCTC, has one data constructor. It's called WrapExpo. And what does it have? It has an HS wrapper that we're going to look at in a second and a nested expression. This HS wrapper um, is going to accommodate all of these guys, the lets, the, um, the type applications, the type abstractions, all of them are going to be in this HS wrapper. So here is HS wrapper. What is HS wrapper? You should think of it as like an expression with a hole in it. It can either be, so, uh, this says, WP whole says, wrap it in nothing at all. WP compose says, wrap it in this and then wrap it in that. Um, WP evlam says, wrap it in lambda, um, lambda this. WP app says, wrap it in apply it to this. Uh, and similarly for uh, uh, abstract it over this and apply it to this here. And then, for, then we can add a let. So the, this, this allows us to build up a whole big pile of red elaboration stuff and then wrap it all at once around a, uh, an expression. Some of these things are core expressions, though. So we are oh, well, some of these, you know, well, they're variables. What's this ev term? I haven't told you what an ev term is. Morally, it's just a core expression. Yes, so uh, yes. So there's little, little fragments of core showing up here. Yeah. yeah. Oh, why do I, oh, why do I use uh, these, these guys instead of HS app? Uh, right. Well, because HS app came from the, uh, but I, I want to be able to, if I look at an abstract syntax tree, I do want to be able to say what is elaboration produced by the type checker and what came from the original syntax tree. Why, uh, is, important why is that important? I, maybe it's not terribly important. Um, but also, I'll tell you, if you look at the compiler, you'll see lots of places that we build up these wrappers from some, you know, we compose these wrappers together a lot, right, before injecting them into the tree. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, you could also build up terms with holes. holes. Well, this is a term with a hole, really, right? You could build up a term with a hole. Or instead of this, you could have a function, you know, of an expression. Oh, and compose the functions together with function compose. But then you can't print them out very easily. I, anyway, don't, don't worry. This is a design. It may not. There are other designs. Yes? Will there always be one hole, or can there be many? Will there always be one hole? There will, there will always be, um, yes, there will always be. In one HS wrapper, there will always be just one hole. Yes, thank you. Um, and there's no way to know that for sure if you look at this, right? It's not statically determined. Probably somebody will try to put a type parameter that'll force that to be the case, but I'm not. Yeah. Why is it called WP hole if it's more like identity? Well, because I think of this as an expression with a hole in it, right? Just imagine a syntax tree with a single hole, which is going to be filled in by this. Okay? Uh, indeed, you know, uh, in the programming language world, you often have expressions with holes in them. They're often called contexts. Um, and this is just one of those. Okay, yeah. Uh, Question from online. Yes. Why not use this instead of this? Yeah. Uh, this is a type family. This is a data type. I, I'm lost. Oh, 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 you could have made all of these into individual constructors in, in, in this guy, I suppose, just collapse these two types. But as I, as I was saying, lots of the code in GHC's type checkers, you'll see if you look at it, builds this data structure out of smaller wrappers. Wrappers get composed together, and then finally, we smash them into here, right? A lot of work happens to make the HS wrapper that we finally stick in the tree. I'm not gonna be able to show you that. We don't have time. Yeah, okay?
Yeah. Uh, okay, that was just head scratching. Fine. Good. <laughs> Plenty of head scratching here. Okay. Okay, so that's, um, uh, that's elaboration and syntax trees and how we're building them up. So I hope that, that gives you some, some big picture. Now, I want to talk about how we're going to actually do type checking, right? And so we're going to do it by generating constraints and then solving them. So if there's one thing that you remember from this entire afternoon, this is the slide to remember. In GHC, type inference show checking takes place by step one, generate constraints, step two, solve the constraints. What do I mean by that? We take a Haskell source program, which has you know, 150 data constructors, so there's a lot, a lot of cases to take account of, and we're going to, do, we're going to generate constraints, and I'm going to show you what, that, what the constraints look like, but the constraints are written in a very small data type. Right? So we go from big data type to small data type. Then we're going to solve the constraints, that's you know, the type checker at work, doing unification and all that kind of thing, and then, oh, and by the way, when we did this constraint generation, we not only produced a bunch of constraints to solve, we also produced an elaborated tree, right? That's the, that HS expert of GHCTC, but it has holes in it, by, and, and I mean a different thing by hole. It has sort of mutable variables scattered in this tree, which when we've done constraint solving, we will have filled in all of those mutable variables. So now we have a tree in which, which is gloriously full of elaboration we can uh, spit out. And, and when we solve the constraints, if we can't solve them all, that means there's a type error, so we can spit out error messages from here. So we don't spit out any error messages, or very few, at this constraint generation stage. We, we solve the constraints, and any we can't solve, we spit out error messages from here. Okay. Does that make sense as a, as a plan? Yes, at the back. Do I use the substitution before I can solve the constraints? Is that, was that question? Yeah. No, no. So solving the constraints produces a substitution, actually you know, physically done by mutating variables, but morally it's just a substitution, global substitution, which is then applied to all of the types in the program. So yeah. How, uh, question, how often, you know, so the question is, how often does it happen? What is it that might happen? Oh, going between generating and solving. Actually, so I, for now, I would just think of it happening just once for the entire program. Um, of course, it's not really like that, but when you have a local let binding and you're doing generalization, then you do have to do some constraint solving. And when you have a type, but, but let, let's not go there yet. We concentrate on one thing at a time. Yeah. OK, fine. So, but, but let's for the moment just imagine uh, we just generate constraints for the entire program and solve them later. That's not quite true. That is not, not really at all true, but, you, but if you get a good intuition about the first thing, you'll be much better equipped to deal with it. Yeah, okay. So, um, uh, the nice thing about this is the constraint generator has a lot of cases, but it's easy to do, right? The code is routine to, for this part, right? Whereas the constraint solver, right? This is, this is really subtle, right? It is hard, but there aren't many cases. It's dealing with a very small language. And the, 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 um, uh, the elaborated program almost comes out in the wash. It's not difficult to, uh, to produce this elaborated program. That's very nice. And another feature about this is that, um, oh, did I talk about error messages? I wanted to talk about error messages. Yes, the error messages, the errors you get, instead of being, oh, I'm in the middle of type checking explicit tuples and there's an error, so I better cough up an error. I'm in the middle of doing uh, something else on list comprehension, so I've got to cough up an error instead. All the errors are generated in uh, just one place. There's just one module in the compiler, one little um, subtree of the compiler that's responsible for generating error messages from the type checker. And generating error messages is blooming hard. There's a lot of code there. So it's really good that it's not mixed up with this gigantic, you know, many, many cases um, piece of code that's generating constraints. It's fantastic. Um, the last thing about this approach that I really like is that if you solve the, if you do type checking solution as you walk over the tree, um, and this is what classic Damas Milner kind of um, type inference does, then the moment you trip over an error, you must report it. But actually, you could report a better error if you waited. So here's an example. Um, uh, so um, you might um, say, you might report an error in, in, in a sort of standard Damas Milner kind of type inference. I can't, I can't unify list of A with bool. And indeed, that's true. But if you waited, you might have discovered that this A was in fact int, and you could report an error that said, I can't unify a list of int with bool. And the programmer thinks, oh, a list of int. Yeah, I know that. I know, you know that should be a list of int. It's just, a, it's just one step better. There's a fewer 
undefined things floating about. So being able to um, uh, wait until the end before reporting errors is quite helpful. Um, and moreover, um, it, it turns out that uh, as the type system gets more complicated, it's awfully easy to get into a situation in which if you type check the program left to right, it would type check. But if you type check it right to left, it wouldn't. And that is deeply embarrassing right, for a compiler writer. Because then programmers write to you and they say, I just changed the order of the arguments of my tuple. And you know, I got a type error. How come? You think that's really bad. Right? But with this um, uh, generate and solve mechanism, we just generate the constraints. The, and the constraint solver is not order dependent. It just looks at the constraints and, and tries to solve them one by one. And it can solve the second one before the first. It's all, it's just by construction, it's order independent. That's really good. OK? So um, uh, this is a much more robust way of writing. Everybody should do this, really. Um, I think, though, that GHC may be the only Type, the only sophisticated type checker in the world that actually does this, even though the idea came from Inria and you know, Didier Rémy and Francois Poitier, uh, but their type checker, that doesn't do this. They just write you know, uh, um, papers about it, um, are really good papers that were inspiring, but GH actually does it. Uh, you had a question. Oh, do, does the solver provide any guarantees is the question. Well, yes. I mean, there is a specification. That we, Haskell is so complicated these days. We have no single canonical, these are the typing rules for the entire language. We have lots of papers about fragments of the language. Um, but so the truth is we have no single specification. Um, and um, and uh, we try very hard to make the solver sort of conflict, not order dependent. Um, and there are still occasional corner cases and trickinesses. Richard and I spend quite a lot of time staring at it. It is not a simple thing. So I don't want to say we have solid guarantees, no. Um, but it gives us, this gives us the vehicle for getting, it's, it's just way easier to fix things here. Yep, yeah, quite the back. So I'm going to show you the syntax of constraints and the data type. Yes, I just want to get the big picture for now. Um, so the question is, is it, the question is, is it a type family? And I'm just going to say, um, ask me later. Um, yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Andrew. So the question is, how, how do you produce error messages coming out here that reflect something about the source program, given that the source program is way over here? Well, as you guessed and you said in your, your, in your question, when we generate constraints, we attach to the constraint source location, and the constraint solver kind of hangs on to those things, um, and, uh, and it all comes out at the end. It's not perfect, uh, but it's not actually that part has not proved to be too difficult. What it's worth. Yes. How does this approach compare to bidirectional type inference? So it kind of is bidirectional type inference, really. Um, you know, I think it, I think it's um, mumble. I don't think I can give a more. It it's very close. I, I don't think I can give a more coherent or precise answer than that at the moment. Um, yeah. So the question is: constraints carry provenance. Um, my slide saying provenance means where they came from. So that's just what we were talking about with Andrew. And then your question is: oh, Is that provenance modified by substitution? Mm -hmm. No, it's not. So the question is, um, uh, haven't I lost, in going from here to here, haven't I lost the fact that I've substituted for A? Well, A was just a unification variable that was invented by the type checker. It has no meaning to the programmer. In fact, the programmer thought it was int all the time. Just the type checker took a little bit of a while to work it out. Well, it is a unification variable, but it came from maybe a type variable. Uh, the unification variable maybe came from a type variable. That be my guess. You could improve it, right? But, but that's what we do. Yeah, at the back. Um, I'm not saying this is, this is perfect. One of the things I would like to do would be to make better provenance for unification variables, because although they are internal, they are born in a particular place. And sometimes they do show up in error messages, sadly. And it would be better if we could say where they came from when, we, when we're forced to display them. OK, so. Uh, Let's see. So the result of all this is that everything is a lot more modular, right? So we really do, physically, in the type checkers, you'll see there's a constraint generator, constraint solver, error message generator, um, and um, uh, oh, and what, uh, the, the, I should say one thing that might end up confusing you is that uh, in the constraint generation part here, um, when we want to say these two types should be equal, right? You might think the si simple thing to do is just say generate a constraint that says these two types must be equal. But that generates a lot of constraints. So it's a bit more efficient if, on the fly, you do a little bit of unification. Um, and, uh, and then if anything looks difficult, you generate a constraint. So there is a little bit of what we call on the fly solving. But you should think of that purely as a efficiency trick, right? And it has no effect on uh, meaning or error messages or anything else. 
Okay, so just in terms of geography, I'd like you to know how to find your way around the type checker. Um, the constraint generation is all in ghc.tc.gen. There's a whole bunch of, and you'll, you'll see, you can see modules inside there. This applying the substitution is in ghc.tc.zonk. The utils has actually got removed recently. Thank you, Sam. Um, uh, the solver is in ghc.tc.solver. The error message generated, ghc.tc.errors. The constraint um, type itself is in here. So the, the, this structure really is reflected in the structure of the source code, and it's helpful if you know that. Um, good. Uh, right, in fact, did I have, yes, here's a, here is a sort of um, the same, the same uh, picture, but here with lines of code and, and comments. So I found uh, C-Lock knows about Haskell and will display lines of code and comment. There's no blank lines in here at all, just code and comments. Uh, so you can see 50,000 lines of Haskell, 41,000 lines of comments. I'm a bit sad that this isn't more than the code, but there's a lot of comments in here. Um, and you can see the generator, look at that, 11,000 lines of code. I told you, big data type, but it's all pretty straightforward. Um, so the solver, 6,000 lines of code. The um, error message generating, 9,000 lines of code. It's actually harder to generate error messages than it is to do this extremely subtle solving. Um, Deriving, there's a whole subtree just for deriving that single feature. This is Ryan Scott's personal fiefdom. You know, nobody else makes commits in this branch. Because we should fix that. <laughs> we should fix that, that's right. Um, but it is, it's, it's remarkable how, just how big and you know, important to, uh, to our users this little part has become. Um, I would never have dreamt it when we first invented the idea. Type and class declarations I haven't talked about at all, and I'm not going to talk about them. All right? This is that's data type declarations and class declarations, we, as well as type checking expressions. We've got to kind check type declarations and class declarations. That's a whole little world of itself. Same general idea, but I'm not going to talk about it. Instances, utilities, zonking. We're going to talk more about zonking and type. So there's a lot of yeah. There, yeah this is the picture. I'm Duncan. Why, why zonk? Why zonk? Why, I'm going to talk about zonking. You mean why is it called zonk? How did the world zonk? I don't know. I was just sort of having a bath one night, but we got to call this thing something. And zonking seemed good, and it's great. It's very Googleable, right? <laughs> <laughs> like it's the only, it's like un unique hit to GHC, as far as I know. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'd read too many comics or something. OK, in fact, we're going to talk about zonking now. Um, I haven't talked about, I don't need to talk about anything else. Oh, except to say, when I talk about emitting constraints, the constraints are emitted into the state monad, right? That's where they accumulate. So they don't show up here. We produce an elaborated term. They just accumulate by side effect in the, in the monad, okay? Literal types, like if you've got a literal type like three or the character seven, and cast and coercions I'm barely going to touch on. Um, now, um, oh, and what's a type, what's this var thing? Ah, so var, is a variable. Variables is a data type which has a constructor for tivar, constructor for TC tivar that will come, and a constructor for ID, that's term level variables. So you might think, this is a bit funny, why are types containing vars which can also be IDs? That's not the, they should never be an ID. This is a, a place where uh, Haskell's type system is um, maybe not quite expressive enough to do everything that we want. There are, a lot, there are lots of reasons why it is like this that I'm not going to get into. I just want to point out that there is an element of dynamic typing in GHC's own implementation, and here is a place. I do not expect to see IDs in types, but I do expect to see tivars, and I do expect to see TC tivars. Okay, yeah. Wouldn't you need this for dependent Haskell? So this is kind of, uh, wouldn't you need to uh, have um, uh, term level IDs in types if you, if you had dependent Haskell? Yes, you probably would. So maybe this is future proofing as well. You could say, is it a feature or is it a bug? I don't know, but then. Um, uh, okay, so uh, um, let me just remark um, lastly, just as I think it's, this is helpful if you ever look at this. Why does Funtai have this funny Funtai flag thing in it? You see, these two arguments, type and type, that make, those are okay. This multiplicity is to do with linear types, so I think we'd safely ignore that for now. This Funtai flag is a, or it has f exactly four constructors, because we've got, actually got four arrows. We've got the ordinary arrow, we've got fat arrow, and we've got two other variants of fat arrow, um, which, is, um, uh, which have different kinds. So there are actually four, type con four arrow type constructors, not one. Um, and but they all show up as fun ties because arrows are so common in core. Really, all of this could be encoded as a Tycon app. 
But in core, we spend so much time taking function types apart and putting them back together, it's better to have fun tie separately. At least, I've never tested the hypothesis that it would be better to do, to do it with tie on that. OK? So that's, little, that's, that's types. Now, uh, uh, I promised a couple of digressions. Ryan also mentioned notes, right? So while I was looking at the data type of types for this talk, uh, and uh, here, by the way, is the data type of var, right? I thought, let's just, let's just reinforce Ryan's remarks about notes. So in here, the verse place, C notes, multiplicity of let binder. C note, local ID and global ID, and the notes appear somewhere else. If all of this stuff appeared right here in line, you would never see the code because it would be thinly distributed in vast amounts of text. Incredibly helpful and very simple device that we use heavily. There are two and a half thousand notes in GHC today. Um, and I hope that every time you make a commit, you will, by default, think, I should write a note to explain what is going on here. Because usually, it's something subtle or a change or th that's worth documenting. A note gives you a place to give an overview where you can describe several things that interlock together. You describe it in one place, and you refer to the same note for many places in, you know, many places in the same module, often many places in other modules, too. So often you're describing how the moving parts fit together. I think of a note as a letter to my future self. I have lost count of the number of hours I spent reading the notes that I wrote five years ago and have completely forgotten. And I think, thank goodness I wrote it, because all of the issues that are here, I would never have thought of. Notes are a great place to put examples, little fragments of code that said, here is a little Haskell program or a little function definition or a data type declaration that would exercise, would show you why this little subtlety here is important. Okay. So please, please take this seriously. Um, there's, uh, they're mentioned in the, in the coding, um, coding style thing. Read notes and please write them. Um, and if, you, if I'm ever reviewing your, your code, you will almost certainly get a request from me to say, please write a note. Uh, yes, do we compile the examples? Uh, oh, in the notes. No, the notes are just free text, really. And they're not, you know, they're not machine checked in any way. Uh, there is a linter that checks if you refer to a note that, doesn't, that it doesn't exist, but that's all. Really, it'd be great if HLS did hyperlinks to notes and things, but uh, I'm sure we'll get there in due course. It's an incredibly simple mechanism, mostly informally enforced, but fantastically at high leverage, I think, in my humble and entirely unbiased opinion. Yeah. Uh, Would it be cool if Haddock looked at these? Would it be cool if Haddock looked at these? I don't know whether it would be cool if Haddock looked at these because it's not about how to use this particular function, right? It's about how a whole collection of functions interlock together and cooperate in a common goal, right? Often. Or it's about a subtle point about a particular line in a function. In types, here's our data type of type backing up to here. These, these can be type variables where we just have a name and a kind. What is a kind? A kind is a synonym for type. I should have put that synonym. There's type kind equals type. So kind is a synonym for type because type variables have kinds which simply are types. So this is the type in type thing. Kinds are not a whole different level. However, in addition, there's these funny things, TC tie bars. So that means that types can contain these guys, which can be unification variables. A unification variable is a type variable that stands for a type, but we don't know yet what it is, all right? So in that sense, it's a meta type variable. So I like in mathematics, you know, let x be an integer such that blah. x stands for an integer, but anyway, so it's going to be, it's going to stand for an, um, an integer. By the time we finished, every unification variable will be filled in. Um, and the process of solving constraints fills them in. But when, we, when, we, when it's born, we just say, uh, this, this unification variable stands for a type. I don't yet know what it is. And here it is. So TC Tyvar here, this guy, he has inside himself, as well as a name and a kind, they still have a name and a kind, right? But inside himself, he has this thing, TC Tyvar details. And what is he? He can be a scholar, which we'll come to later, and a meta TV. That's a unification variable. Meta unification variable, synonymous in the type checkers. Um, vocabulary, and inside this meta TV is a, ooh, an IO ref, ooh, right? So a type checker monad did the IO monad, so it's a mutable variable that can contain either flexi, meaning I haven't been filled in yet, or indirect type, meaning I have been filled in. Somebody has told me that I stand for this type. So, as it were, I've now become invisible. I'm, I'm, I have no separate identity anymore. I simply stand for that type, okay? That's the idea. So, um, now, uh, um, then zonking, which we were referring to just now, is the process of 
replacing a filled in meta type variable with the type that it is being filled in with. So in, in, a, in the type structure, instead of saying tyvar of alpha, you'll say tyvar of, you know, tycon app of blah, if alpha has been filled in with tycon app of blah, okay? So Zonking sort of walks over the structure, taking all those mutable variables, and if they're being filled in, it replaces them with the, with the type, right? And that's, a, so it is monadic. And the reason it's a separate pass is because um, it means that type, things that scrutinize types don't need to worry about um, meta type variables. If you zonk first, you can then uh, you know, say, are you a Tycon app without having to think, oh, you might be a meta type variable which is being filled in. OK? Um, yeah. What is a scolum type variable? I'm going to tell you later. Um, so I haven't got to there yet. Just before we break, uh, there are actually two completely separate zonkers. Right? And Sam, like a week ago, has committed a patch that makes them separate rather than having them being sort of, you know, twined around each other and you couldn't really tell that there were two. So, thank you, Sam. Uh, so the first zonker is the one I told you about. It's used during type inference, and its main zonking function takes a TC type, that is, one that can have TC tie bars in it, unification variables in it, and produces something that can still have unification variables in it. But at the end of type checking, when all is said and done, we expect there to be no unification variables left. And then we want to produce, take a TC type to a type, meaning no unification variables. TC type, type, they're synonyms. TC type is a synonym for type, but it, the, the clue is there can be unification variables in here, but not in here. And this Zonka also walks over terms, that huge abstract syntax, as well as types, whereas this guy only needs to walk over types. So he's quite small, and he's used a lot during type checking. He's quite big, and he's used once at the end of type checking. So it's just worth keeping separate. And they live in different modules. ghc.tc.zonk.type and ghc.tc.zonk.tc.type. Um, last thing about sort of unification variables and things. I said, I gave you here the signature of TC mono expert. And like, I've concentrated on this type because it's quite a nice, simple type. This really is, you know, I'm not concealing anything. This really is the type of the thing. But I'd like you to understand every piece of it. We talked about the monad. We talked about the, you know, what it means to have the, these abstract syntax trees. We talked about these passes. We haven't talked about this exp type thing. What's exp type? It's the expected type. And this is because the type checker works, as it were, in two modes. So this gets back a bit to the question about bidirectional type inference, right? Sometimes you know what type something. If you give an expression a type signature, you can imagine you want to push that type signature down into the term, right? So if I've got... Um, 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 uh, uh, if I have lambda x dot blah with type um, for all a, a arrow, a, oh, blimey, uh, arrow, blah, right? So there's a type signature for this term that says uh, you're an arrow and your argument type is a polymorphic function. So what does that tell you about x if you push it down? It tells you that x has type for all a, a, o, o, a, right? So it should be OK to see x true uh, paired with x applied to um, the character x, right? That should be fine. But only because we push that type down, right? So there's a, you know, so bidirectional type of inference, a, a lot of it is about let's push down the information we know. But sometimes we don't know anything. We have to infer the type of something. Um, and then, then you might think, oh, maybe we should just push down a. What could we push down to infer the type? A unification variable, why not, right? But unification variables stand for monotypes, remember? So it's very important, hugely important invariant of GHC. Unification variables stand for monotypes. Everybody say it together. Unification variables stand for monotypes. Very good. So we can't push down a unification variable. Or if I um, said, please infer the type of lambda x colon colon, for all a, a, arrow, a, dot, blah, right? If I infer the type of this, I should get the type for all a, a, arrow, a, dot, blah, arrow, something, right? So I couldn't get a monotype out of this. So I can't push down a unification variable, but I am going to push down something that is very like a unification variable. So x type either says I'm checking, and here is the type I'm pushing down, or it says I'm inferring, and here is something a bit like a unification variable, an infer result. And what does it have? Just like a variable, uh, just like a, a, a TC type R, it has a unique that gives it an identity, not terribly important actually. Um, it has a level that we haven't talked about yet, and very importantly, it has this IO ref, right? Just like a, um, 
a uh, unification variable that can be filled in. And in fact, when I push it down, it must be filled in. So by the time I finish, it will be filled in. It's very, it's sort of linear. I can, yeah, um, uh, yeah. Um, and, but it can be filled in, unlike unification variables. This guy can be filled in with a polytype. So that's what, that's what this exp type thing, it's a very important piece of geography to know about the, the type checker. Yet another data type declaration. Maybe we're going to get to 100, OK? Um, and, and so that the single type checker, single constraint generator works both for checking, pushing down, and for inference, sort of bubbling up. Yes, question with the orange. Oh, why do we have variants of exp type, like exp row type and so forth? Uh, I'm not going to go there. Uh, uh, it'll, I'll, it's more, I've got more, probably, probably things that are more important to say, but I will, I'll ha happily talk to you afterwards, yes. So you might have, when you're inferring a type, you might like to say, I'm never going to infer a type that has for alls at the top, right? And so that would be an exp row type. And it just turns out that in the type inference algorithm we have, there is that invariant. It never generates things with for alls at the top, so we might as well say so. Um, yeah. No, 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 Beckham. So, so the question is, uh, this is uh, you know, source syntax, but this is not source syntax. That's fine. This is the thing we're type checking, and this is simply the, you know, the type checker's story about what type it is expecting it to have. That's true. So if you, so in this example here, right, uh, the question is, have we already done desugaring on types? In this example here, this guy, this is an HS expert here. And this guy here started life as an HS type with lots of constructors. And then we kind checked that type and desugared it, right, all the way. So we, we went all the way to a type that those internal core things that I told you about, and that, that is the guy that we push into here. So yes, the, for, the, for the types themselves, we are going to desugar during type checking, as it were. Yeah, thank you, good point, because it might not have been far from obvious. Right, yes, so, and th this is, yes, I think you've got the, the idea, checking and inference. So it's really good that, this, with this simple idea, I went through many variants of this, but this has turned out to be a very nice, simple way of having a single constraint generator that can account for uh, checking as well as inference. Very, it was a big help. Okay, now we're going to get back to constraints, finally. Right, remember the picture? Um, we're going to talk about uh, what constraints look like and how do we solve them. So constraints are in a very small language. What sort of constraints do we have? Class constraints, like EQ of T, that's a class constraint, or equality constraints, like um, int should be equal to alpha, right? So those are the two main kinds of constraints. This stuff here is just saying we can have an empty set of constraints, or we can take the union of two sets of constraints. That's all a big constraint. And this guy here, implication constraints, I'm going to get to later. So we're just going to concentrate on these two for the moment. And just like in terms, uh, we need to elaborate terms. So constraints also are elaborated. Constraints carry evidence. So the evidence for a class constraint is that little V table or dictionary of methods, right, which I think you're probably mostly familiar with. That's the evidence for a dictionary constraint. The evidence for an equality constraint is a coercion, which I'm not going to have time to tell you very much about. But just so you can, but in terms of intuition, you can think of it as being just as we need evidence for uh, class constraints, so we're going to need evidence for equality constraints as well. Um, GHC is very systematic about doing this. Um, so every constraint in the constraint solver comes decorated with the evidence that, that witnesses it. So let me give you a little example. Supposing you've got these, these three constraints. You've got that list of beta should be the same as list of delta, and list of delta should be the same as list of int, and uh, I need ord beta. Now, beta and alpha and delta and so forth, they're unification variables. They're types. We don't know what types yet. We're going to try and figure that out. Um, that's the process of solving. So what do we do? We take the constraints. We just pick one constraint and try to make it a bit simpler. And then we stuff it back in the pool. So we, we, we pish, pick a fish from the pool. We say, aha, you look solvable, let, or, or at least simplifiable. I'll simplify you a bit put, and put, your, put you back in the pool and then uh, uh, solved. Maybe I have some new constraints to solve, and then I keep doing that. Yes, question. Can there be, me oh, so this is back to, um, uh, back to here. Can there be meta, meta tie bars in this TC type? Yes, there definitely can. Yeah. Um, uh, because an example, how might that happen? Let me just give you a quick example of how there might be a 
uh, unification variable in the type that we are checking against. Supposing I've got f that has type for all a, let's say, um, a uh, comma int arrow blah, uh, and then I have a call f applied to e. Well, um, I'm saying I've got a, so I, I've got a, I'm going to call f, so I'm going to instantiate this a with a new type alpha, well, a new unification variable alpha. Say, so, oh, okay, so now the type of this argument must be what? Um, must be alpha comma int. That must be the type of the argument, right? So I'm going to push alpha comma int into that argument, check that the argument has that type. So uh, ask Gogo if he's happy now, right? So, that, so definitely, it's hugely important that the, this guy has metatype variables in it, and that we might find out from E. I mean, if E turned out to be something like uh, the character C um, and three, then we would discover that alpha is char from pushing it down. So yeah, okay. We're gonna, uh, so here I just said, let's pick out this beta equals gamma thing. Let's pick it out and oh, if I got list of one thing equals list of the other thing, it must be the case that beta and gamma are the same. So I say, fine, let's delete that constraint and replace it with beta equals gamma. And then I've got the constraint, let's, let me now pick this guy, beta equals gamma. If beta equals gamma, I can unify beta with gamma. They must be, I can, you know, side effect beta to be gamma. They're two unification variables standing for a type. They must stand for the same type because they're equal. So I'll just sort of short circuit them together, right? I'm writing that with a colon equals here. That's meant to connote a sort of side effecting modification, right? In, what do you mean delta rather than gamma? Ah, oh, delta, thank you. Yeah, globally substitute delta for gamma in everything I just said. Thank you, yes, so, so now, uh, now what do we have? Um, delta equals list of int. Well, I can do the same thing, therefore delta must be int. Uh, and now what can I say? Oh, that means that, um, again, if delta must be int, I can again unify delta with int. And you know, here's my side affecting um, uh, unification. And now this delta here, ooh, here's a little bit of, here's a little bit of zonking going on, right? I need to, I need to uh, when I'm looking at this constraint, I can't solve order of delta. But if I remember that delta has been equal to int, then I can solve order of int from the incidence declaration for order of int. Now I get some evidence for uh, d. I, you know, I also am going to produce some evidence for, uh, for d, and now I've solved all the constraints. Does that make sense? A, so the plan is take a bigger bag of constraints, pick one, make it a bit simpler, throw, if I, I might get some new constraints that I've got to solve, throw them back in the pool, and just keep doing that until you've got no constraints left, or until you can't make any progress. If you can't make any, pro make any progress, that's the constraints you can't solve, you're gonna report them later as an error. Okay, that's the plan, yes. Oh, what order did you pick the constraints? Who knows? Does it ever affect the output? Does it ever, oh, does the order in which you pick the constraints affect the output? I hope not. I don't have a proof. That's what you refer to as confluence, yeah. But the idea is no, it shouldn't matter. Um, it's sufficiently complicated that I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't bet my daughter's life on it never being true, but I, I'm trying hard to make it true. Yeah, Vlad. What is the time complexity uh, of this process? I don't really have a good answer to that either. Um, in practice, there's a sort of priority queue that says I'm gonna solve equality constraints first. You pick one and then, you know, if you can't solve it, you stick in, uh, usually you think, I really can't solve this, I'll stick it in a pile that I won't look at again. Um, it doesn't seem to be too bad in practice. Uh, you know, the, all the bad performance holes in the type checker are things to do with type sharing, that not this process. Anybody else? Yeah. You, you're saying, when we solve one of these constraints, or at least simplify it, we remove the old constraint from the set. Yeah, and, and it's, it's enough to remove it. The new one is enough. So uh, we never need to go back to the old one, in fact. Oh, how does this work? So, so how does solving from instance declarations work? Well, the instance declarations, um, you know, uh, somewhere at the top of your program, and so you built up a sort of database of instance declarations, and so the, the solver looks in the database and says, ha, huh, order of int, yeah, I've got, a, I've got a solution for that, and moreover, I have a witness for it. I actually have a dictionary for ord int that was, you know, bound at the top level. Right, I can use that. Or maybe it was ek arrow eek list of a. I can use that dictionary function, so forth, yeah. Uh, last thing, just, just to stress though, is this D, uh, having decided from these top level instance declarations that D is equal to ord int, I've got to put that binding. This D is mentioned in the term, right, somewhere. Somewhere in the term, I've now called a function passing D to it. So I need to bind D. So when I've decided that D is equal to this top level instance declaration thing, I better inject that into the term. Um, and that's, that's done by the, um, 
in, into the elaborated term. I, I, I think I, we sort of skipped that a bit earlier. We mustn't forget it. OK. All right. Now, uh, I want to sort of take a sort of, you know, a little um, break uh, now and um, look at what, uh, sort of have a bit of fun by looking at, you can watch the type checker in action. I do this quite a lot. So here's a little, a little program. Um, what does it, what does it do? It's got a little bit of overloading, and it calls x is equals y. These are lists, but we've only got ek. And then you can say ghc dash c of foo.hs ddump tc trace. And so if you do ddump tc trace, this is what you get to see. Oh, um, um, uh, okay. This is uh, eighteen hundred lines of traces comes from the. Um, from the type checker, and so you can. Uh, where, where do these th where do these um, messages come from? They come from bits in the source code where you'll see TC trace blah, right? Anything that says TC trace is going to emit one of these. If you don't say ddump TC trace, nothing happens. So this is sort of printf debugging, if you like. But a lot of printfs are there in the in the code already. Um, they're not terribly strategically placed. There's no grand strategy. I sort of sprinkled a few in as I was debugging. Sometimes I remove them. Sometimes I leave them. You may want to add more for yourself. Feel free to add some more TC traces or to remove ones you feel are um, onerous. Um, but let's um, uh, um, here's an interesting one. So this is uh, simplify top. Do you remember we said we're going to generate constraints and then solve them once at the top level for the whole program? Simplify top is the once at the top level for the whole program, constraint simplifier. And here it is, look. It says, oh, um, I'm going to solve this wanted constraint, this de constraint, which is eek a. And I've got to solve it from, oh, here's a given constraint, which is an eek, oh, well, a different kind of a. Uh, that's a scolum a, right? And this is a unific. This sk stands for scolum because he comes from, where did he come from? Um, the original program, let's see. Um, oh, drat. Um, here. This A here. So uh, th there's a type variable A here that, I, that, I've, that is not like a unification variable. It, doesn't, it, it stands just for itself. It can never be, it's not equal to int or something. It's like a, a constant. We'll call it scolum to make it sound impressive. Um, and, uh, so, and this EK is the thing from which we can solve the eek list of a constraint that we get from this equality. Does that make sense? We've got to solve the eek list of a from the ek. And that shows up very directly here um, in that from this eek a, I've got to solve this eek list of a. You see, wanted, that's the, what I want to solve, given that's what I got available to solve it from. You might think, why isn't this list of a? Anybody, any guesses as to why this doesn't say eek list of a? Yeah. I assume it's because eek a implies eek list of a. No, wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't filled it in yet. Yeah, this is a unification verbal. That's what that tau means, in fact. And so um, I haven't figured out yet that this a akv is, all, is equal to list of a aki. How can I see that? Well, in fact, in this particular example, this has already happened. I'm going to search. A very useful search. Look, watch, watch my keystrokes. I'm going to search upward for colon equals. Um, oh, that was useful. Remember the unifications I said I'm going to write that as colon equals. Look, um, write meta tivar. That was my unification. Um, a A K V. That was the unification variable. Is equal to list of A A K I. Ah, oh, look at that. All right. So I've already um, unified. It doesn't show up in this um, at this stage. Uh, it hasn't shown up in my print because I haven't zonked this yet, right, but, it's, but it's been unified nevertheless. So then you can watch the solver in action. Solve wanted does a bit of walking inside these implication constraints that I haven't told you about yet. And finally it gets to this, start solver pipeline. This is a good place to look for. And it says, oh, G stands for given. That's the constraint that I've got that I, in, in my hand that I know. Um, and uh, so, he, so, and he, um, so uh, there's not much to, for, to, to do for him. He's just going to, um, uh, uh, we're just going to put him in the database. So here now, in the inerts, that is the, all the stuff the type checker now knows, you can see there's this given eek of AKR. And now the work item up here, 
I'm going to solve this AKW business. And oh, look, I still haven't zonked it, but there it is. So the first thing that, that happens in the next few lines is that I'm going to um, uh, follow the filled Tyvar, right? That, this is the zonking stage, right? We're, look, we're looking through it. We say, now it's equal to list of this. And then we look a bit further down. Oh, and we're going to try to solve this eek list of A dictionary. And a bit further down, I think we'll, um, oh, look, we look it up match instant. So here you go, Farad. Um, we're looking up um, eek list of AKR in the instance found. And look, match class success. We find an instance declaration for eek list of A. Um, and um, then we're going to generate a binding. And then we're going to end up with, um, what are we going to end up with? We still, we're going to end up with a, uh, come on, oh. Um, uh, why didn't we, uh, I was sort of expecting to see another stage in my pipeline. But I think I'm running, I'm out of time, so I'm not going to. Oh, then having solved the eat list of A, I'm now, oh no, pass. I'm not going to get diverted. Um, but you can spend a, a long, and long and happy hours looking at traces of the type checker in action. And this is, this is the constraint solver um, in action. Um, and um, uh, what else to say about it? Yes. Uh, just when looking at this, here are some suggestions. Um, there's, a, there's a little bit here which says, when, you, when it starts the bindings for a new function, you'll see there's this bindings for thing. And then there's a closing curly brace. Right? There's a curly brace here. And you know, uh, 300 lines later, there's a closed curly brace. So I have Emacs set up so I can look for matching curly braces easy. It's a very good way of navigating around this. Um, most of the messages are arranged to have matching braces. Um, I hope unification, this match meta thing. And um, uh, yes, and um, yes, lots of matching braces on these guys. OK, uh, last thing to say, always build your development compiler with D debug on. Or is this sort of build flavor? What is it? Hadr what's the Hadrian incantation? OK, there's a flavor transformer for switching on D debug. Switch it on. Because it's, uh, it, it, it adds a whole lot of assertions, which slow things down a bit, but which catch your mistakes earlier. The what flavor? Uh, Devel two. Oh, Devel two. Yeah. Okay, has this switched on? Assertions, yes. Okay, all assertions. That's good. Um, I, I I have it permanently switched on, so I've forgotten what it's like to run a compiler without this on. Uh, implication constraints. So this is the one additional concept for the constraint solving thing that unlocks a raft of. Uh, it's one idea that has great utility and is systematically used a lot. If you, if you can understand this idea, it'll, it'll, it'll make understanding GHC's type checker and constraint solver much simpler for you. So um, uh, it was, for me, a, you know, this was also in Francois Patier's um, paper. It took me a long time to understand it. But once I did, it was like, ah, oh, this is the dawn of a new age. So prepare for the dawn. Are you ready? Um, so let's start with this data type. Uh, here, which has which has an existential variable, right? So T does not have um, a type argument at all, but there is this um, for all a show a business on the left. And so um, uh, when I call muck T three, what happens? Well, let's say I, maybe this is an int. Um, I should have said three colon colon int. Then T inside itself is going to have a dictionary for show a um, and the int type, and it's going so it's going to be a pair of a dictionary for showing ints and an int value. And this guy will be a pair of a dictionary for showing bools and a bool value. OK? Um, now then, um, uh, right, so that's how I can build it. Now, when I take it apart, so when I pattern match on t, well then, what happens? Um, I can then call show, even though this function has no show anywhere near it, I can call show here because this x guy, which is the uh, you know, whose type is A from the data constructor, right, has a show A dictionary for it. And, and it's, it's easier when you see it in core. So this is the core elaborated form. But the data type T really has a type argument here and a term argument that is the dictionary for show, right? So it binds A, this pattern match binds the type variable A, and it binds this given dictionary of type show A, and it binds X with type A. And then when I call show, I can pass the show, well, the type A and the given dictionary. OK? So let's pause just a, just a second and make sure you're happy, happy with this. It's very important here that you know, this, this A is existential. It's not mentioned outside. This A is, comes into scope right in the right-hand side of this pattern match and nowhere else. OK? Um, 
So something funny is going on here because some of these given dictionaries are sort of local, right? So as I walk inside sub-expressions, new, uh, you know, outside here, show A wasn't in the dictionary, show A wasn't available. Indeed, A didn't even make sense, it wasn't in scope. But inside, it's so available and, and you know, it's crucially useful in solving this constraint. So somehow, we have to have some way of nesting these givenness things, okay? So what do we do? Um, uh, uh, let's see, I think I'm gonna skip um, this and skip straight to, oh, right. So we're going to have a, what constraints are we going to generate? The constraints we're gonna generate are um, include this constraint for, um, uh, I've, sh I've showed, it where, where's my constraint syntax? I sh we've talked about these two, we haven't talked about this guy, so now we're gonna talk about this guy, which is a form of constraint that we can solve. Oops, uh, here we go, and it goes, for all A, show A double, this is just a form of constraint, and inside here, I need a dictionary type show delta, I need delta equals A and gamma equals string. Um, but there's a bit puzzling here, because, you know, what is this A, um, and how can we solve this, this uh, D equals show gamma from this um, show A. Um, yeah, the question was, previously when we had ord int, there was some global evidence, the instance declarations for solving it. Here the evidence is local. Super important, yes, the evidence is local. And then how do you return it? Well, it's, I mean, it's, the evidence is local because it's bound here, right, in the term. It really is a pattern match that binds GD, the, that local piece of evidence. Oh, do we capture the evidence in the implication? Yes. Look, here it is, GD colon. Do we, yeah, do we? That's right, so this implication says, assume that GD with type show A is in scope somehow, and it will be because we're going to stuff the solution into a term that looks like this. So it says, assume that GD with this, with this type is in scope, and now solve these constraints. That is what an implication constraint does. Oh, is this, is this identifier, GD, the same one that appears in the term? It is the same one that appears in the term. The constraint generator generated this elaboration, remember, and as it generated the elaboration, it made up a fresh name, GD, stuffed it into the elaborated term, and generated a constraint that looked like um, this, that uh, made that GD available to solve these constraints. Uh, actually, here, yes, yeah, yeah, okay. Now, uh, so we talked about the implications. I was just gonna show you the last few data types before we, before we wrap up. So, uh, lots of data types in this talk. This is in, um, uh, I think, GHC um, uh, TC uh, types, a constraint. Um, so, but, but it's not so hard. Look, wanted constraints. This is the collection of constraints that accumulate, that the, the constraint generator accumulates. So as it walks over the term, it, in a state monad, generates a larger and larger wanted constraints. What is a wanted constraint? It's a bag of CTs. Those are simple constraints like um, these guys. And it generates a bag of implication constraints, that is, these guys. So in fact, these two and this are different data types. These are flat constraints, CTs. These are implication constraints, which are called implications here. We won't worry about delayed errors at all for now. Um, so what is a CT? Well, um, it can be a, a dictionary constraint, an equality constraint, an irreducible constraint, a quantified constraint, which we're not going to talk about at all, the whole new extension, and um, they start life as a non-canonical constraint. I'd quite like this to be separate, but um, this is a fairly civilized type. I want to just show you what uh, C dict can, this dict CT, what is he? Well, he says, I have a cl class applied to these types. An equality constraint says, oh, I've got, so left-hand side is equal to right-hand side. Um, yeah, at the back. Which module is this? I think it's GHCTC types constraint. Is that right? Oh, what is this? Xi. Ah, this is, so this is yet another type synonym for type. And these are not very well policed. This was meant, this is meant to be um, a type with no type families in it. Um, yes, because in the, in, cl in class constraints, we're not meant to have any type families. Okay, but an implication constraint, ah, oh, that has quite a few things in it. Well, that has um, a, a list of, well, it has those, uh, let's see, it's got to have some fools for the scolum variables and some given constraints. And look, there they are, uh, the scolum variables and the given constraints, they live here. And then the body is, that's this stuff, that is the, one of these wanted constraints, again, one of these. So there can be implications inside the implications. Um, 
And this evidence variable I'm not going to talk about, but that's where the, bi the dictionary bindings are accumulated. Um, so this is, you can look at this through half-closed eyes, but, um, uh, but I've got time to go into the, the details. I just want you to get the sense that, you know, this is really all of constraints. Um, it's all on side. Oh, oh, sorry, the question is, uh, uh, could, you, could your constraints have looked exactly like this data type with one constructor for each of these? And you could, it's just, but I've done something said that's isomorphic, um, which is to have this is a type, this is a type, and this empty and uh, union thing is handled by the um, bag stuff here. You could do it another way. Seems like a little more going on. Seems like a little more going on here than there. Maybe so. Um, uh, you could experiment with refactoring it and see if it looked better, faster. But anyway, um, um, it, it's quite helpful to find all of the flat constraints first and solve them first, then go into the implications. Uh, yes, at the back. What is the Canic left-hand side? So, this, uh, so what is Canic LHS? Well, this equality, right? In general, an equality you might think would just be T1 equals T2 for arbitrary types, but this is a canonical equality. Um, which means we've already done the constraint solver. By the time it builds this guy, it's already you know, done list of A equals list of B. It's already smashed that away. So the, the sort of minimal equality it's got down to is like type variable equals type. That's Tyvar LHS. Or possibly type family application equals type. That's TyFam LHS. Right? So um, the non-canonical uh, thing is what you get when you've got, just got T1 equals T2. Okay, all right, uh, I don't think I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna skip this. I'm going to skip uh, this too, except to say that, um, do you remember we talked about these scolums? Um, well, that's where those scolum TVs, those TC Tyvar scolum TVs show up. Uh, Simon, uh, yeah. just a, like one sentence on irreducible constraints, because I don't think uh, that was that. Well, I didn't talk about irreducible constraints. What does this mean? So this means, um, so some constraints we can make canonical. Like uh, in one of these forms, the canonical ones we can do things with, like we can use these for substitution. Um, but, um, uh, but a constraint like, uh, I don't know, A applied to B, that is a constraint, right? Because it has kind constraint, and sometimes people write, you know, F, if, if somebody writes something like, um, um, F has type for all A and B, um, A applied to B, double arrow, blah, you're allowed to do this. Um, if A has kind something to constraint, but there's not much you can do with this constraint or by way of sol solving it. So it gets put in this irreducible pile. Um, and then the constraint solver, if you then have an equality that tells you what A or B are, then we can apply it and that might, that might t turn it into EK or something useful. Then it turns into a canonical constraint. Yeah, insoluble constraints also land up in this area, like int equals bool. We don't want to drop int equals bool. We want to leave it around so that we can report it as an error later. They end up in this pile as well. Um, the last piece of implication constraints are um, uh, the, this is a sort of, as soon as you get into implications, in fact, any, anywhere in the in JHC's touch, you, you come across level numbers. And unless you have a visceral sense of what level numbers are doing, you'll find it all quite mysterious. But actually, level numbers are fairly simple. So here's the idea. Look. Um, uh, suppose I had this, this program. Look at this program as a top, at the top. Is that well typed? Oh, this T is the same T that I had before. Here, here it is, here's its type signature. It's an existential, right? Is this well typed? No. Why is this not well typed? The scolum has escaped, yes. That's a really horrible error message to give to a user. Um, but you know, it sounds like uh, you know, the wombat has funkle ponkled. So you know, users none the wiser, but it's really hard to think of a better way to say it. The scolum has escaped, right? Because there's no way we can give a type to this whole expression because its type is the, you know, the type that's bound locally within that MUC T. So this is bad. So at least let's make sure we reject it. Then we can figure out how to give a good error message. How are we going to reject it? Well, what we're going to have is we're going to find that we've got, um, from the lambda, we're going to say, oh, um, you know, this F2 must have type beta arrow gamma, because after all, there's a lambda here, right? So uh, alpha, which is, uh, did I, I didn't put this, um, F2, let's say F2 has type alpha, it's certainly a beta arrow gamma. Beta is the argument type, so beta will be the type of T. Gamma is the result type. Okay, 
So then inside, we're going to keep pushing gamma inside, and then we'll say, oh, gamma had better be equal to A. Right? Inside our implication constraint, we'll then generate an implication constraint arising from this, this pattern match on MUT. Remember, that's what generated the implication. And then we're going to say gamma is equal to A. Now, constraint solver says, ooh, unification variable equal to something. Thumbs up, I can unify. Right? No, 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 no. That would be very bad. Because gamma, as it were, comes from the world outside, the big wide world. And this A thing is this, ooh, very local, just under the MUT. See the problem? We cannot unify, uh, we cannot make the big wide world see this A. So what are we to do? Well, uh, there's a lot of ways you could, you could handle this, but the way that we now handle this is to, um, uh, to use level numbers. So every TC tie var, whether it's a skolum or unification variable, has a level number. The level numbers on implication constraints strictly increase. So this has level number two. If there was an implication inside, it would have level three. If there was another implication constra constraint inside, it would have level four. As you walk inside an implication, you increase the level, okay? Then, um, but gamma was born before we got anywhere near this implication. So he has level one. So when unification variables are born, they are born with a sort of ambient level from their context, carried by the monad, of course. Um, so gamma was born with level number one. So inside here, we see gamma of level one is equal to A of level two. And then our rule is, when unifying a variable, we can only, we cannot unify a variable with a type, I mean, this is a type variable, but it might mean alpha, it might mean A arrow A or something like that. We can't unify uh, a unification variable with a type that contains any variable of level number greater than the unification variable, right? And so it's pretty simple. It really is just a matter of taking the free variables of the type and saying, are there any level numbers bigger than the level number on the free variable? We don't need to look at type environments and search for free variables. No, it's just, it's pretty straightforward. Does that make sense? Yeah, question. question. What does level zero mean? It's just, just the top level. Uh, why was it one? I mean, it could be one or it could be zero. I actually forget. There is a top level. I think it's zero. It might be one. But we've got to start somewhere. Um, yes. Is this also applied for GADTs? Well, absolutely, yes. So GADTs, um, Gorgadets, have, they may not, oh, they, they also bind existentials. So, so yes, when you walk inside a, a Gadot match, which of course might bind some equalities, not just some type class constraints like here, but some equality constraints, you increase the level number exactly the same. So all of this works smoothly for, for Gadots, yes. Um, Vlad, so uh, Vlad's question is, as you go down the tree walking inside implications, the level numbers go up. That's gonna stop you unifying with something from outside, but what's to stop you unifying with something from a peer, right? Well, it's sort of, you can never see it. It will just never happen, right? Because you can never get hold of, uh, you know, you can never get hold of a unification variable from a peer con constraint. It just can't happen. Because the are also uh, just because how could you possibly see that, you know, the only way you can, you can talk about, you, the only way you can get hold of a type is from the type environment or from something you, a fresh variable you make up yourself. For the type environment, it would always be from further out. You have no way to get hold of any types from a peer. Um, no, they'll be, they, they'll be, they're different, each branch will have its own implication if they're existential. Remember, it comes not from a case, but from each branch of a case. Look, uh, where was it? In my pattern match here, this only had one data constructor. If I had three data constructors, I'd get three implications. I mean, I, I'm confident this part is okay, okay. But, yeah, but I agree you need to think about it. Yes, well, what happens if I put show before the case? You'd say show of case T? Yeah. Well, that, this is ill-typed anyway. So putting show in front is not going to help. Yeah, it, it could work, right? No. All the info is there to make it work. Hypothetically, right? Not, not. Okay, so there's a hypothetical question about some extension to the type system. Go write a spec. Uh, give, give me some examples, you know. So be, be my guest. I don't know how to do that. I don't, yeah, you have to be. Right. Are, there, are, there, are there any other constructs that bump levels apart from case expressions? Yes. Um, and they are um, uh, principally let bindings. 
So in the right-hand side of a let binding, I'm going to bump the level because I'm then going to generalize. And generalization, which I do not have time to talk about, also uses level numbers to decide which type variables I can generalize over and which belong to some outer scope. So level numbers are very useful for generalization and type inference as well. Um, they do double duty. Yes, at the back, uh, John. Uh, if you did Richard Eisenberg's um, uh, existential thing in an ICFP paper last year, could we get rid of level numbers? I very much doubt it. Um, I, and again, I'm not going to have time to go into sort of hypotheticals about, about I mean, that is a well-specified system, but I'm pretty, I'm 99% sure we'd still need, need level numbers in exactly this way. Yeah. Can you generate equality constraints from a functional dependency? Uh, so functional dependencies indeed generate equality constraints, but they're just local between, between you know, when you compare two, con two class constraints, there's a functional dependency between them, you just generate a local equality. I'm not, I don't think it interacts with level numbers at all. Okay, so I'm conscious that we're uh, running out of time. What have we got? We've got level numbers. Oh, where do the level numbers live? Look, they're right here. Skolem TVs in TC Tyvar details have a level number. Meta TVs have a level number. Do you remember? And that expected type have, had a level number too. A level number is just an integer. So it's quite a simple idea, but very, very, uh, you know, pervasive and I think quite powerful. Um, okay, so, uh, right. Um, I think I'm gonna, well, how are we doing? We've got to finish in? It's five o'clock right now. Five o'clock, we have five minutes. Okay, so let me, let me skip this. Uh, and be, well, I talked during constraint generation, when I said unification variables are born with a particular level number, the constraint generator uh, carries an ambient level, and whenever it coughs up a new unification variable, it gives it the, the variable. And whenever it steps inside a case, it's going to bump the level number. Ah. One little thing about level numbers and cases, if I'm just pattern matching on a maybe, just, you know, just and nothing, they don't bind any type variables, they don't bind any constraints, they're completely vanilla. I don't need to make an implication constraint for every one of those, otherwise I'd be awash in implication constraints. So as an efficiency, efficiency hack, um, we don't generate, uh, we don't bump level numbers when we walk inside, um, or generate implications when we walk inside, um, you know, completely vanilla uh, data constructors, pattern matches. Uh, that's what uh, this is saying. No need for this wrapping. Yeah. It's just an efficiency thing. Um, uh, uh, right, I'm going to skip this as well. Um, right. And I think I'm going to skip this because we're out of time. Oh, let, let me just let me just say very briefly. We talked about um, uh, here. Well, you didn't. The only thing you didn't pull me up on was in my description of constraints. They all had this CT evidence thing. What is that? Well, there are two sorts of constraints which I've informally suggested so far: given constraints and wanted constraints. But they're not distinguished at this level. They're distinguished in the CT evidence. The CT evidence which is, you know, share every, every one of these constraints have a CT evidence. Look, it's inside an equality. It's inside a, uh, a dict. It's inside a non-canonical. They all have a CT evidence. The CT evidence says for a, for a given, it says, oh, here is an evidence variable bound in the term which you may use to solve constraints of this type. And for wanted, it says, you are obliged to come up with a proof of this constraint, this guy, this TC pred type, yet another synonym for type, by the way. Um, and please put the evidence in this destination. Right? This is what to do with the evidence once you've generated it. And this lock is the provenance, that is, where it came from, where it was born. Uh, this is also where the given was born. Okay, so... Uh, Right. So, as it were, this CT evidence, that's the core of the constraints, and this stuff is like sort of wrappers around it that say, oh, it's in canonical form, and I, there's a bit of redundant information here. This class and xi, right, that's also effectively embedded inside the type of the constraint. So if this was eek of int, then this guy would be eek int. But this just makes it accessible, so the solver always has its fingers on the bits that it needs without having to keep taking types apart. Okay. Uh, so here we are, I want to finish up. This is the picture I want you to remember, right? Uh, if you remember nothing else. Um, and um, uh, there's, there's whole mountains of stuff that I have not had a time to talk about. Um, but, um, uh, but what I'm hoping is that I've given you enough intellectual scaffolding 
that when you want to look into any one of these things, you will have some of the basic framework you could sort of hang on. Is what, what, what's terrible is you're looking at detail at something, but you don't have anything to hang those, those concepts on. I want, you to, I want you to have the scaffolding. Um, and the good thing is that actually the scaffolding I've give you, given you really do, is enough to accommodate all of this, this crazy stuff. We don't need to, new stuff. This, this framework that I've described here is robust enough and sort of extensible enough to handle all kinds of crazy things, which is really good. Um, there's a couple of papers uh, to read and a, a special thank you to Francois and Didier for um, explaining to me this idea about um, implication constraints.